Secretary also rise to this uh, talk to this motion that this House expresses its grave concern about the medical crisis in country Western Australia and the lack of resources and priority for country health. And of note that this was a um, this was a motion of the Labor Party back a number of years, uh, and and given um, that they have attacked uh, the uh, the former government for its lack of performance in many areas, um, I would uh, also. Uh, consider that they may still believe that there's a crisis in country health and should actually be supporting this, uh, this motion because we do know that there's been less of a concerted effort by the current government to address those, uh, those ongoing issues that uh, country communities face uh, in the provision of health services than there was under the previous government. Uh, and where we saw uh, a previous government introducing hundreds of millions of dollars of investment through the uh, Southern Inland Health Initiative. Um, what we saw locally in my electorate uh, was cuts to programs which had been announced, uh, cuts to the Turquoise Coast Health Initiative, cuts to aged care. I think the member for Rowe spoke about the aged care, um, not strictly speaking, um, if you like, uh, not strictly speaking part of the health department's budget, but certainly a very, uh, a very major part of what goes towards making a country town uh, a healthy place to live. Uh, is the ability for its older citizens to remain in those places. Uh, and I recently had the opportunity to travel to Canada on the parliamentary exchange uh, to Saskatchewan and, uh, and saw numerous towns there um, where they had magnificent facilities for aged care in, uh, in communities no bigger, uh, no richer uh, and just as remote uh, as the communities that make up the bulk of, uh, of the electorates uh, uh, that National Party members represent. And I could see no reason why, if Canada and Saskatchewan in particular uh, can provide uh, those types of facilities in the towns and in the districts in which people live, that we in Western Australia can't do just as well. Uh, because uh, we are a state very similar to them, we're rich in resources, uh, but we do have a uh, somewhat uh, greater population, and I think we have a few things going for us that they do not. Uh, and it surprises me that. Uh, that in some ways um, we're so far behind uh, what a uh, comparable uh, situation in Canada would be. We know that the, um, uh, the fabric of country towns relies upon its health services, as been outlined by the member for Central Wheatbelt and the member for Rowe, uh, and that one of those fundamental services is St John's Ambulance. And I'll just briefly uh, diverge and speak about them very briefly. Um, we recently had a discussion forum in the town of 2J. Uh, oh, sorry, Northern, Northern, Northern. But there were a significant number of people from 2J at that. At that um, so, so hence uh, my view that I forgot that I had actually gone to Northern. I don't often go to Northern, but I had gone to Northern that day. <laughs> we worked together occasionally. No, we're always we're always working together. That's 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 I'm. The passports for stamp. I'm uh, I'm. Uh, I don't often go to Northern because it's just that extra little bit down the road. It's a lovely town, and it's full of services and uh, uh, and the like, which which my community would dearly love to uh, to be see spread out throughout the rest of the communities. However, at this forum in uh, in Northern, at which many 2J people are, were present. Um, some of the discussion points were around St John's, and I think the member for Rowe spoke about the, and perhaps the member for Central Wheatbelt, uh, spoke about the, um, the costs of, um, to the state of Western Australia if St John's was to be fully funded by the state, uh, as opposed to the volunteers. There does seem to be a difference in view in the next of different substations. Uh, uh, those substations which have access to a good pool of volunteers actually quite happy to do quite a bit of this patient transfer between hospitals. Um, so, for instance, going up to Dalwallanew uh, and picking up a patient, bringing him to Northam or taking him to, uh, to Perth is an activity that the 2J sub-centre actually encourages. Um, but they're in a situation where they have a strong number of relatively well uh, um, and not really, really old retirees and part-time workers who actually can uh, can do that. In other communities, such as the uh, communities around Karnamar, etc., uh, where they're expected to provide that same sort of service for, uh, say, Murrow or Three Springs Hospital to, to Geraldton, that's a real strain. And, uh, and those communities are, they don't have that uh, cohort of, um, 
uh, of people who have um, maybe retired from full-time work uh, who are able to volunteer. They're, many times they're, they're under the pump because their volunteers may need to actually also be the local mechanic or, or work on the local shire, etc. So, um, so they don't have that pool of volunteers and there is a real amount of pressure which is being put on some of those communities because of, of the withdrawal, I think, of services that used to be provided in the local hospitals. Um, the tendency now is that you take the patient to the place where the best level of care is available within reach for that person. Oftentimes that's in a larger regional hospital uh, or in Perth rather than in the smaller country hospitals. Uh, and that means that basically St John's are acting as an orderly, if you like, shoveling um, patients um, between wards, except the wards might be many hours apart by road transport. As I say, that's not an issue for some St John's ambulance uh, sub-centres, but it is an issue for others. And I, I do think we do need to look very carefully at situations such as the Midwest, um, such as, uh, as exists in Durian Bay, where there's an inordinate amount of, of uh, transfers that take place out of that town because there isn't actually a hospital. So, um, so we do have different situations. And another little situation that the 2J sub-centre has um, come up against too, by the way, is that they uh, had the initiative of beginning a, uh, a system of patient transport, not, uh, not, a hosp not, a, not an ambulance, but a small car, which uh, doesn't need to have a fully fledged ambulance driver to operate uh, in, in 2J and surrounds around the, the uh, upper part of the Avon Valley there. Um, and they uh, take people to either from the, um, you know, the, the nearby farmlets. A lot of people live on hobby farms around 2J. They bring them into town to uh, appointments in 2J or they might take them to Northern or townspeople down to, uh, to the metro area. Um, and that's a great service which has been introduced uh, uh, for, the, um, for the people in the area. But one of the problems they face is that when they come to the metropolitan area, um, and they go to the local hospitals, they're being hit by, and I do want the Minister to take note of this because I'd, I'd like him to, to address it if possible, but these people are actually um, uh, being charged a significant amount of parking fees while they're down in the metro area, uh, and it is affecting their ability to provide this service um, into um, some of the metropolitan hospitals. Uh, and, and their request is that perhaps um, there might be some exemption or some sort of a system worked out where perhaps they might be um, refunded or, or provided with a, a, some other discounted rate or, 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 a, or a refund. Because uh, that's a great service. Um, I know other towns have begun uh, to do that sort of thing. I know Gingin some time ago uh, uh, did a similar sort of thing, Lancelin and other communities. Um, because uh, I do have a lot of um, uh, elderly uh, people who live in, uh, in the electorate, oftentimes when they lose the ability to drive, or their partner loses the ability to drive, um, they are very, very isolated. There's no public transport to speak of, uh, and they have no other way of getting to, uh, to appointments, etc., except by a car. Um, and they're often prevailing upon friends and, and the like, and, and a lot of them are proud sort of people. They don't like to do, to do that too much. But if there is a, a service which is there and available, then I would hope that they would use that, and, uh, and that wouldn't uh, offend their sense of pride. Um, another community which has uh, faced uh, some challenge in recent times has been the Jinjin community. Uh, Jinjin has had a period of time where the medical, the uh, medical office of the GP rather, um, there has been a, a problem in the provision of GP services in that town, and uh, and because of that, um, it's it's quite a topical issue around that area. And, and recently, one of our local uh, branch meetings of the National Party were got together. That was the focus of of discussion was about how you could better um, provide uh, medical services into those nearer uh, areas. Um, so Jinj in particular, but their nearest option is, is Chittering, which is already um, under a great deal of um, stress. Uh, and so there does need to be a way, I think, to, um, to ensure that GPs are more available in, uh, in regional areas. And I do know that um, uh, as I recall seeing some figures some time ago, that basically West Australian country people uh, do not get as much money from the federal government through Medicare payments as other areas. Um, yes, well, that's good. Um, but we need to, to actually start to use some of that money 
to, um, to not just say, well, how come the doctors are all in, I don't know, some, uh, the member for Netherlands has probably got lots of doctors in his electorate, for instance. Um, why are they all there? He's not here at the moment. I'm not slandering him, but he, he often boasts to me that he has many, many doctors in his electorate. The member for Cottesloe may have some, uh, but many are in Netherlands as well. But I can assure you there are not many in Moore, and uh, probably not many in Rowe, and not too many in Central Wheatbelt. Uh, and, uh, and we would like to see some of them recognise that there's a business opportunity out here. I mean, surely they're in a business, and it can't all be, be, always be about lifestyle. There's, there's money to be made in going out to the regions and servicing the needs of the regions. because. Where our populations are actually uh, generally older, they're generally sicker, uh, and they generally receive less, uh, less uh, uh, Medicare rebate than other areas. Now, to me, you know, money talks, and maybe that's the way that we can, can get people out there and, and perhaps uh, change their view about where it is to, a good idea to have a business. Um, and certainly uh, a lot of the, uh, the towns that uh, um, are struggling to have uh, fine GPs have very good facilities. They're, they're actually quite pleasant places to, to, to work. Uh, and I'm sure if people got out there and uh, saw what was available, uh, it might start to turn itself around. But nonetheless, the, uh, the Jin Jin uh, branch of our, of our party sees that as, as one of their major priorities. And, uh, and they intend to go to our state conference and demand some action from, in a policy sense at least, to try to uh, bring about change uh, um, for, those, um, for those people. Uh, recently, I was in another area of my electorate up at uh, Northampton, and uh, and people were telling me there about the uh, the problems that they have in in keeping a doctor in Northampton. Um, there is a doctor service available, but on a part-time basis, uh, and uh, and that doctor service has a has a um, a surgery in uh, Jordan as well. Um, there's a hospital in Northampton which is ageing uh, and desperate need of um, of upgrade. And, uh, and indeed, uh, that was one of the, one of the hospitals which uh, I know at, uh, at some stage I saw was listed as a priority um, under the previous government uh, for further investment down the track. Um, it is the first hospital uh, that you will come across when you leave the pastoral areas and come into the, the settled areas. It does actually service a, a large uh, catchment to the north and there are um, uh, large uh, amounts of um, uh, traffic and other um, situations which can be dealt with at that uh, particular hospital. Um, and of course, um, not having a full-time doctor makes it very hard for uh, the town to keep a range of other services uh, in the town. Um, I actually have a number of communities where we have uh, pharmacists without actually there being a doctor in the town. Uh, pharmacists provide uh, quite a good uh, level of service for um, for a number of, um, of people in uh, uh, a number of those communities, they provide really the only uh, continual uh, service um, of medical uh, services into the town, um, as opposed to other communities where you might have a, a number of doctors available. And, uh, and I do know that the, um, the pharmacy, uh, there's a group called Rural, Rural Pharmacy Network in Australia, and they, they were um, explaining to me the other day that um, they see some potential there for pharmacists to play a, a bigger role uh, in health delivery within, uh, within those uh, communities uh, as part of, a, of an effort to, to, I suppose, better coordinate, uh, not to take away from the doctors, but to, uh, to ensure that they can, they can actually take care of things like uh, monitoring those chronic disease conditions like diabetes, etc. Um, which take up a lot of doctor time. Uh, and when you haven't actually got a continual doctor service in the town, it's hard for people to keep on top of those, um, those diseases and to keep on top of their medications, etc. cetera. Um, and they, you know, they haven't got the, the ability just to go into the doctor and have a review when they need to. And also, a lot of these communities are characterised by having locum doctor services. Um, they don't have the continuity of the old country family doctor that might, people might have some view about, um, quite often you're going to have a different doctor every time you go in. Uh, and, uh, and so those doctors are not familiar with the patient, often not familiar even with the region and the services that are available in the region, uh, and, uh, and they're certainly sometimes not even familiar with um, some of the funding uh, requirements and, 
and the limitations of what can be uh, authorised for people. Now, I do know, Minister, that you did authorise pharmacies to be able to, for instance, uh, provide vaccines um, more fully uh, quite recently, and that's a, that's a good step. Um, but, as I say, um, those sort of things like keeping on top of uh, people's um, medications, and because people go to different areas, they see different doctors, they might be sent to hospital in, I don't know, in Geraldton, and then they might have to go to Perth, and, and they come back. And sometimes, um, you know, it's been pointed out to me, some of the medications actually conflict with one another, that they've been given a suite of medications by a range of different, uh, uh, different uh, doctors, etc. Uh, and there does need to be someone to actually overview that and, and keep an eye. A real challenge around that stuff because they're travelling around the country, yeah. dragging their prescriptions around with them, you know, yeah. and um, and you know, so, so from that perspective, assisting yep. them is particularly tricky. Well, um, we have a we have a number of grey nomads travelling through, but um, my concern is with mainly those people who are living in the area and have no other choice. They can't hop in a large RV and go to Carnarvon or somewhere else and, and get a medical service. They they're actually you they have to live in Northampton and and make available. You know, make do with what's available in that uh, in that community. So, but I take your point that it's um, you know that well, there are well, other people well, and there are other circumstances yeah. where those sort of things happen. There, there are real challenges for yeah. for, for rural pharmacies. Yeah, yeah, that yeah. certainly is. And uh, and while we're talking about that area um, up in the Midwest, um, I think uh, you know for some time uh, there's been situations of of need, unmet need for for workforce. Um, in the area, there was a practice which had been built up by the local wax over the period where they would go and get, uh, you know, agency staff to fill in gaps, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I have to say that the, you know, there's a concerted effort in recent years to try to get away from that. Now, could I have an extension, please? Extension granted. Uh, and uh, and that was very important because, you know, you need to actually have, um, you know, some uh, more economically uh, sensible things than paying enormous amounts of money for someone to come in. For a short period of time, uh, who doesn't live in the area? There's a, there's a lot of uh, options uh, uh, locally sometimes which are, were not being fully explored, and I think other people have spoken about Geraldton as a as an area where there is a potential, I think a huge potential for um, you know workforce development to be a focal point for that Midwest area because, as I said before, we have a we have a degree of um, opportunity where we have um, less than optimal uptake of, of Medicare um, because people simply aren't getting to doctors or aren't getting that sort of uh, the, the medical treatment plans, etc., which they should actually properly be getting because they're seeing locums or occasionally seeing doctors when they should be getting uh, more continuity of treatment. Um, and, uh, and also, um, I think, uh, opportunities for things such as the NDIS uh, and... Uh, and um, and aged care, which, whilst, yeah, whilst uh, not strictly speaking your area, um, I think is uh, also an area where some of that there's a there's a synergy, if you like, between the, the training that could take place uh, for wax and for for other. Um, health, uh, member, just uh, member for South Perth and the uh, minister are talking less than sotto voce, mm. and uh, you are distracting the uh, the speaker. Thank you. Good. Now that, he's, now that we've got the member of South Perth under control, um, so um, so we were saying that there, there is an opportunity there to uh, to actually build on on what's available. I mean, there's there's great uh, facilities uh, at the local TAFE, uh, um, at the uh, the rural uh, clinical centre there. Um, so there are different opportunities. The the Geraldton University Centre as well um, to uh, to actually drive some of that. There's actually a need for employment. In some of these areas as well, there's um, significant um, underemployment of um, of some uh, age groups within the within a lot of the towns. And I think if they could actually envisage that they could work in the health services and get trained and get a good uh, good a good wage um, from that uh, training, I think there might be an uptake um, of those opportunities. That's why I think that GDC nursing school is so important because. Mm. I, mean, I agree. Pe the people who go and study there will be locals or yep. people from other parts of regional Western Australia, and yep. we know exactly where they'll go plough their trade immediately yep. after graduating. I agree, um, but it needs to be part of a concerted workforce development plan yeah, for the right. region. Mm. 
And that's one of the things which, um, uh, under the, the previous government, the, the Midwest Development uh, uh, Commission uh, did a, um, a, a regional health plan for the Midwest. Um, and actually, I think the name Tim Shackleton was mentioned before. So Tim uh, actually headed up that, um, that, uh, um, that program and developed that strategy. Uh, and amongst other things, such as you know, improvements to the hospital, et cetera, um, workforce development was probably the key, um, the key thing for improving health services in the Midwest. And, uh, and I see that as you know, an opportunity to actually improve the health services, improve the ability of the town to keep older people uh, and less well people in the town, but also to provide those services from within the town uh, so that there's uh, money flowing from Canberra uh, and from Perth and other places into those communities and they're getting their fair share of the human services that other, that other communities uh, take for granted. And as I said before, um, there's a number of ways you can do that, uh, potentially through, um, uh, through not just uh, things like um, the pharmacies, but also by uh, unlocking the potential of, um, the latent potential of underused um, human resources within the town. People who haven't got a job, who perhaps could have a job if they thought there was a job there to have. Um, I don't think they see the opportunity, uh, and I think it was too easy in the past for the health department and others just to go and grab a trained person, uh, instead of thinking about, well, how can we actually put, set up a situation where in the future we've got a pool of people we can call on and we're never going to be short of, um, of staff uh, into the future again. Um, now, today, Minister, I note that you, you read in the, uh, um, the bill for, uh, to enable voluntary assisted dying. And, uh, and I note back in a, uh, an MPI back in uh, March, 20th of March uh, uh, 19, we discussed um, the importance of palliative care uh, as part of that, that program. Um, now, at that point, we didn't have a budget uh, figure. Um, and I, I do know and I acknowledge that the government has um, put money uh, in the budget uh, for, um, uh, for this program. And in your speech today, I think you mentioned that uh, uh, a total of uh, $206 million will be spent on improving palliative care over the next four years. My concern with all of that, as I outlined back then, and I continue to outline now, is that in my electorate, there really is lacking a superstructure of, of medical centres and, and services, or, or service points, to actually deliver these services. Um, and that because of that lack of infrastructure, um, which the cutting of the turquoise coast and that health initiative did, did actually accentuate, um, you know, we will miss out on, on the improvements to services. Um, so places that, like the member for Roe, uh, highlighted a number of towns where, where he has hospitals, etc. cetera. Um, those places will, no doubt, um, uh, get an improvement in services. I'm not so sure that uh, communities um, like a Lehman or a Greenhead or a Cervantes is going to, to see any improvement in services because there isn't really, you know, there isn't really the, um, the, that superstructure there to deliver it. And, uh, and so um, that will lead to further disadvantage for, for my communities. Now, I did highlight that at the, um, at the last, um, during the NPI, uh, and I think uh, in response, yourself and the member for Morley uh, did promise that there would be action on these matters. Um, I, I take you at your word, but I'm pointing out that in my area there will still be gaps uh, unless there is a concerted effort to address that, that inability to, um, to provide these services where you don't have hospitals, etc. And I do know the, uh, note the Honourable Jackie Boydell on radio today, and you had a bit of a discussion about these types of issues. I thought that was one minute, seven minutes. Um, so I thought I was winding down very quickly. Um, so now we can relax a bit longer. Um, but anyway, the, the, the timber of that discussion was that um, not just uh, in palliative care, but also in actual delivery of the assisted dying, um, there are uh, requirements for consultations and for opportunities to, uh, to, um, to meet with a number of health professionals, which is not always easy when you, when you don't have numbers of health professionals in your community. So, um, so I do hope that there will be a concerted effort to... Uh, to address those issues um, in the future, 
uh, not just uh, through the assisted dying legislation, but through your program for palliative care, um, because I don't believe that uh, we have at the moment anything um, like an acceptable level of palliative care uh, in country, Western Australia, in many communities, not all. I think Albany's been highlighted as an example where it does work. It's a larger community, um, and you know there's some dedicated uh, professionals who uh, have, uh, have worked in that area for a long time. Um, but without that um, local champion and without that, that larger critical mass, um, it's hard to see how, how it will advance. And I do know it's, it's not always easy to do because um, the Morrowa Hospital had a, um, uh, um, a number of aged care units um, within it for, for a number of years. When they built the hospital, which isn't that long ago, um, there was a, a, um, a room set aside for palliative care. But because there was no one needing palliative care immediately, the pressure was on to actually open that up for aged care. And, and then the opportunity disappears for people in the future. Now, I'm not sure today exactly whether that bed's available or, or not for palliative care, but at times it has not been because it's been chewed up for, for aged care. Um, and it's hard to have, you know, to have uh, facilities available uh, for people when it's rather episodic. Uh, when, the, when the use may be. So I appreciate all of that. Uh, it will take uh, more than just um, business as usual to address these issues. And, uh, and I think your strategy needs to be you know, sympathetic to the very, very diverse range of um, communities where, um, where we, we represent. And you know, I, uh, in saying that, acknowledge fully that there are communities out in the remote areas of the state, which are where those problems will be even, even more difficult, and I think probably um, we have just ignored um, the issue for for many years and not had to address it. Um, oftentimes, uh, you're either uh, not known that the person is ill, or they're actually moved to a different area and they disappear into the system in the metropolitan area, and, and nobody uh, knows that they that's not where they want to be. Anyway, thank you for listening, and uh, and I hope that um, you know you will bear in mind that this was originally your motion, um, that there was a crisis in health, your as in labour, um, and that you will um, I think uh, you know think very carefully about what you've done to address that, and uh, and perhaps understand that there are still some critical failures, and perhaps you should come over this side when we come to vote, and acknowledge that there is that crisis, and uh, and that you need to reprioritise your government's efforts to, uh, to ensure that that crisis is addressed.